Okay, in the interest of time, I will begin, although some attendees may still be joining us um, as we begin speaking. Uh, my name is Daniela Whitman, and um, my co-host, Dr. Sharon Bober, and I, both of us members of the Mental Health Committee of the Sexual Medicine Society, want to welcome you to the webinar on what does culture have to do with it, expanding the lens of sexual medicine. Uh, we are very lucky to have two very experienced and internationally known presenters who will present their research and their clinical experience to you. I want to mention a couple of housekeeping items. Um, one is that we will answer questions at the end of the presentation, so not during the presentations. And so if you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A function, not into the chat function, into the Q&A, because that's where we, the moderators, will be looking for your questions to give to the presenters after their presentations. And without further ado, let me ask Dr. Bober to introduce our first speaker. It is really my pleasure to introduce all of you to uh, Ms. Tali Rosenbaum, who is a, a well-known and wonderful individual and couples therapist. She's a sex therapist that is ASEC certified and also uh, certified by the Israeli Society for Sex Therapists. Uh, Dr. Ms. Rosenbaum co-hosts the Intimate a Judaism podcast and is co-author of the book, I Am For My Beloved, A Guide to Enhanced Intimacy for Married Couples. She co-edited the Springer textbook entitled The Overactive Pelvic Floor and has authored over 40 journal, 40 journal articles and several book chapters on sexual pain disorder, sexual health, marriage, sexuality, and Judaism, um, and is an associate editor of Sexual Medicine Reviews. In addition to maintaining a private practice, she's an academic advisor for Yahel, the Center, Center for Jewish Intimacy, and we are really delighted to have Tali here with us today. Thank you. Okay, are you able to see my slides? Okay. I I'm not getting any answers, but I think I'm okay. We, we can see them just fine. Okay, great. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much to the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, and thank you, uh, Daniela and Sharon, uh, for this invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be here today um, to talk about traditional and faith-based cultures. Uh, I have no disclosures, but I did put together some of my publications, which uh, I did use in preparing this talk. Please feel free to go to my website and look under publications. Uh, they're all available, the full texts. So let's talk about uh, sexual health and the biopsychosocial model. Uh, we recognize that uh, biology and psychology are important components and that sexual development and sexual difficulties do have a, uh, a multi-ideological origin. Um, but frequently the factors related to the social and cultural components get ignored. So we wanna give that adequate attention today, especially to physicians who are dealing with patients from uh, a variety of backgrounds. Sociocultural factors are important because they inform how sexual information is obtained, uh, what are the decisions that are made regarding what is the appropriate age, for sexual intercourse, what are the appropriate sexual behaviors, the age of first intercourse. Um, they inform our attitudes about gender and sexual orientation and the development of desire, the development of intimate relationships and concepts and expectations regarding uh, love relationships are formed by culture. So for example, you may know about Sternberg's triangle model of love, which Robert Sternberg uh, developed in 1994. And he talked about romantic love as having three basic components, passion, intimacy, and commitment. And when we look at this from a Western secular lens, um, we look at relationships as beginning with a great deal of passion, this surge of dopamine, we idealize our partner, and obviously there's a great deal of attraction and a great deal of sex. Um, after that initial phase, uh, the next phase of the relationship, after the 
uh, when we begin to see our partner in all sorts of uh, in all sorts of ways with sweatpants and with a runny nose and we get to know our partners better um, that would be intimacy phase and if we survive the intimacy intimacy phase we go on to commitment and even though we may be completely um, we may look at this normatively and some relationships may begin more with intimacy friendship and then move into passion. We also need to be aware that in some cultures, especially where there's arranged marriage, uh, commitment may be the first thing uh, with the expectation that passion and intimacy come after. So I think it's difficult to talk about being sensitive to culture without talking about the challenges that may arise for us as practitioners, as well as the ethical challenges. Sexuality and sexual behaviors vary widely across different sociocultural spheres. And it's important for us as practitioners to examine our own beliefs and our own biases and what we might know or not know about other cultures. So for example, that Orthodox Jews have sex through a hole in the sheet, which is a myth. We also have to understand that our ideas of autonomy and consent may be challenged in cultures where there are continue to be relationships of hierarchy or of power differentials. And this is gonna be challenging. Um, we, we, health professionals must provide a culturally informed approach to care within an ethical framework that imbues respect, understanding and tolerance. But at the same time, we need to be aware and manage our own reactions to, situa to situations that may appear to challenge our understanding of sexual and reproductive rights. I think one good example would be a young man who comes to see the urologist because he's masturbating and you find out that he actually only masturbates once or twice a week, but masturbating is against his faith and he wants you to give him androgen uh, inhibitors so that he won't have a drive. And what would you do in that situation? So let's talk about religion. Values and traditions regarding sexual meaning, ritual, and practice are essential parts of many religions. And traditional values may restrict access to knowledge about sex. And that can create a situation where people go to pornography to find out their information about sex. Uh, restricted and limited se sexual behaviors may impact sexuality. And of course, um, people may uh, experience a great deal of conflict between their sexuality and their religious values. And this may continue to be a source of guilt and shame. Another aspect of this is that sexual behaviors, which may be considered by all sexual health practitioners as normative, may be pathologized. So let's look at Orthodox Judaism, and I'm hoping that uh, this will be kind of a template for other faith-based religions. I'm going to speak a little bit about Orthodox Judaism with the expectation that it will apply to many fundamental faiths. So Judaism, I'm sorry, Judaism is um, a monotheistic religion, um, but is in no means monolithic. There's quite a spectrum of practice from uh, secular to ultra-Orthodox. I'm gonna talk specifically about the ultra-Orthodox. So in Judaism, sex is mandated not only for the purpose of procreation, but also for the sake of expressing and enhancing love and closeness. And a man is obligated by the marital contract to provide sex to his wife. Uh, sex is considered to be an obligation in marriage, but it is also understood that no partner can force one another into sex and that sex must be mutual and consensual. Um, the three important principles in Jewish marriage are uh, exclusivity and sanctity, so no sleeping with other people, but also no flirting with other people. Um, family purity, which means that during uh, the woman's period and for a week after, uh, the couple separates. They have no physical um, interaction until uh, the woman immerses in a ritual bath. And then, sec and then sexual relations are resumed. And this may have clinical applications regarding birth control methods, uh, regarding interventions that you might want to provide because they need to um, be interrupted by the two-week period of um, separation. And also one other principle is modesty. Modesty in marital relations refers uh, to dress as well as behavior, and it refers to the extent in which clients might feel comfortable talking about 
um, their sexuality and certainly in any kind of display of, of their sexuality. And it's important clinically in order to find the appropriate language. Other sexual health related clinical is issues, uh, traditional couples will look at sex as ultimately intercourse. Um, they also may be very limited in their knowledge and awareness about sexual information, about sexual anatomy or physiology. Um, we have to keep in mind the cognitive dissonance in the expectation that there be no prior emotional or physical intimacy. And then there's an expectation for full sexual intercourse on the wedding night or shortly thereafter, which can feel like a goal. We need to keep in mind the uh, effect of the family purity laws on couples physically as well as emotionally. And also to be aware of ejaculation restrictions, including masturbation, and for many traditional couples, any kind of ejaculation outside of the vagina. That has important clinical implications for uh, sensate focus or other interventions, which may be met with concern if they cause ejaculation outside the vagina. And so this is why clergy involvement is important. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about men and women. Um, the male existential conflict, because self-arousal and masturbation are seen as prohibited, young men are encouraged to guard their eyes, to not look at um, any kind of uh, stimuli. Many young men will struggle with this and they will lose their belief in their own ability to self-regulate. They'll believe that once they're aroused, there's now no choice but to somehow ejaculate. Arousal can actually feel triggering. Some men are able to, young men before marriage, just turn off their sex drive completely, but then they're expected to go from prohibition to uh, obligation. Um, they, they may feel a lot of pressure in doing so, pressure to achieve erection, to succeed in intercourse, to ejaculate at the right time, uh, to please his wife and make her happy. And the need to regulate himself sexually might be difficult. Clinically, what we'll find are women who say, I just want to be able to hug and cuddle and, uh, you know, be with my partner with some physical intimacy without having to, to, to have sex with him afterwards. And he will be needing to navigate the conflict between not wanting to coerce his partner, but also not really having an alternative to having sex with her. So now you can probably understand what the, based on that, what the experience of the woman's going to be. Um, a fundamental value of ultra-orthodoxy is modesty in dress and behavior, and much of the discourse relates to uh, guarding the eyes of men. Um, women also cover their hairs after marriage, and after marriage, they are expected to uh, provide sexual intercourse also as a way to guard their husbands from inappropriate sexual behavior. So there's a real role identity shift. It's a culture that values uh, chastity and virginity, um, but suddenly you're expected to succeed and be good, as some patients have put it, I now have to be good by being bad. Many women will talk about their perception of sex as an obligation despite either pain or lack of desire. And even though they are allowed to say no, they might have gotten some kind of message that it's not okay to say no, and they will fear the ejaculation restrictions. The impact of ejaculatory restrictions on the couple um, can be premature or delayed uh, ejaculation, fear of non-vaginal ejaculation, which can prompt attempted penetration before the, uh, the woman is ready. The woman with sexual pain might feel this burden and obligation to contain her husband's seed, even though it hurts her. And so it's important to appreciate the individual and relational uh, effects of this dynamic. So lifestyle considerations, just it's important to mention because it's life cycle, it's not just at early marriage. Also that uh, these um, clients, these patients often have very large families, so there might be pelvic floor issues, um, childbearing years concerns, birth control. Uh, they might want to choose birth controls that allows them to control their menstruation, but also be aware that birth control options may be limited. For example, a woman with sexual pain may not want to use a barrier method, but condoms are forbidden. So these are things that are important to know about. And there may also be issues surrounding menopause, aging, and chronic illness. I'm actually finished, but I did want to bring just two quick slides because you are a 
Scientific Society. This is um, this is a study that we did in, that we published in 2009, comparing the Lauman study to a sample of Orthodox Jewish women. And what we found real quickly is that even though we found a slightly higher rate of sexual dysfunction, the frequency of sex um, was higher, which led us to conclude this idea that women see sex as an obligation. Um, in the qualitative portion, women said that they wished that they would have learned more about appropriate sexual expectations, about intercourse and technique, about what men think about sex, about consummating the marriage, positions, what is sexual dysfunction, and more information about other kinds of sex and what's permitted and what's not. Finally, the take home message, um, working with a faith-based population requires respect for culture and a willingness to work with their clergy. Appreciate that autonomy and consent are not necessarily givens and provide opportunities for both partners to express their thoughts and their feelings. Basic psychoeducation is essential. Talking about women's arousal, um, that just like you, a man needs an erection in order to perform, it's very performance-based, unfortunately, women also need to be aroused, that their vaginas need lubrication, and it is their arousal that will make intercourse uh, be facilitated, just like it's facilitated for a man when he is aroused. Um, and there are so many other educational messages that you can help this, these couples with. Remember that sexual health is multifactorial and referral to an individual or a couple sex therapist is often indicated. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tari, for your excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, and I will now move to introducing our next speaker, but before I do so, uh, I'm going to again encourage everybody to enter their questions into the Q&A function so that, um, you know, we can answer your questions or our speakers can answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Okay. So it is now my greatest pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Hall, who is the immediate past president of the Society for Sex Therapy and Research, STAR. She's the co-editor of Principles and Practice of Sex Therapy, uh, now in its sixth edition, and of the cultural context of sexual pleasure and problems, psychotherapy with diverse clients. Her book, Reclaiming Your Sexual Self, How You Can Bring Desire Back Into Your Life, won the STAR Consumer Book Award in 2006. She has held clinical and adjunct faculty appointments and taught at a variety of institutions, most notably Rutgers Medical School, McGill University, and Ryder University. Her clinical and research career has spanned three decades and included work with incarcerated sex offenders, as well as clinical directorship of a program focused on sexually abused children and their families. She currently has an active private practice where she specializes in the treatment of a broad range of sexual issues. Her clinical and research interests are focused on cultural differences in the experience and treatment of sexual problems. Welcome, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Daniela. Okay, thank you. I am delighted to be here. I am going to be broadening our discussion uh, based off of Tally's excellent presentation to understand how sexual scripts defined by culture, privilege sexual pleasure, contribute to sexual problems, and complicate treatment. I'm gonna do that all in less than 20 minutes. I have no relevant financial disclosures to make, although I do have the following disclaimer and a nod to Tina Turner who provided the title uh, for our presentation today. So you've all seen statistics like this, um, which attest to the high global prevalence of sexual problems. Okay. I've added um, statistics on that syndrome, which is uh, a presentation of anxiety and some vague physical complaints relating to perceived physical weakness, which is attributed to semen loss. The fact that this is an increasingly global prevalence, there's an increasing global prevalence of that syndrome, questions its distinction as a culture-bound syndrome and highlights the importance accorded to semen in various cultural groups. 
The cultural groups um, in which DAT syndrome is most prevalent would be in Asia and Southeast Asia and the Middle East. And this is the cultural groups that I work most uh, predominantly with. And so they will form the basis of my talk today. One way of seeing how culture impacts sexuality is not just looking at global prevalence or differences across countries, but it's looking at what problems people seek help for. So although men globally complain or will say that they experience low desire, it's only really in the West and in some parts of uh, Western Europe that we see that men come to sex therapy or to their physicians complaining about low sexual desire. In most other parts of the world, men are complaining about performance issues, specifically premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction. But it may be that one of the ways that men complain about low desire in other parts of the world is to describe it as a in more physical terminology. And DAT syndrome, for example, may be a way in which men are complaining about uh, a sexual lethargy um, that might otherwise be known as low desire. In some parts of the Middle East, and Tally referred to this um, when she was talking about how difficult it is or how stressful it can be for couples on their wedding night to have to consummate their marriage. So this has been uh, labeled handkerchief stress, which is the extreme pressure that men feel to have penetrative sex on the night of their wedding. This not only produces proof of their bride's virginity, but it also produces proof of a man's potency to produce a blood-stained handkerchief to relatives who are waiting often on the other side of the door. The situation can be a little bit more complex when we look at the global prevalence of female sexual problems. It's very difficult to come up with sort of general estimates as we did for male problems because there's such a wide variability. Now this variability could reflect differences in the study methodologies, but it may also speak to the fact that women's sexual problems are heavily influenced by culture, maybe even more so than men's. This global variation um, requires us to look a little bit more closely at whether uh, studies are conducted in urban, urban versus rural settings whether we're looking at more traditional or more liberal, sexually liberal cultures, the degree of adherence to religious values and traditions, both within the culture, within the country, and within that person's community or family, and also the status of women. It's important to know that in countries and cultures and families, relationships where women can't make decisions about who they're going to marry, who they're going to have sex with, about their healthcare, their education, the number and timing of their offspring, it's very difficult to imagine them having sexual agency or at least enough sexual agency to enjoy sexual experiences. So when we look around the world at treatment-seeking behavior for uh, female sexual dysfunctions, we find that in, the, in North America, what we're seeing a lot of, in fact, the primary complaint to sex therapy clinics is low sexual desire on the part of women. This is also true in Australia and in parts of the UK, as well as in other parts of Western Europe. But in the vast majority of the world, it's vaginismus or pain with penetrative sex that are problems for which women frequently seek help. These are problems in many parts of the world because vaginismus interferes with their partner's sexual pleasure, so it becomes a couple's problem or a problem for a man. And it also interferes, of course, with the ability to bear children. And an unconsummated marriage can have devastating consequences for a woman in a traditional culture. So I want to bring your attention to three ways in which culture influences sexuality. It sets the normative standard and therefore defines also what's problematic or deviant or even what is ideal. It determines what problems are worthy of treatment and it determines who can be consulted about these sexual problems and what treatments are appropriate 
The who, of course, in this case, is you, physicians, because in the West, while sex therapy and psychotherapy in general are accepted practices, they are not firmly established in other parts of the world, and in many cultures, they don't enjoy the same acceptance as Western medicine does. So most men and women from traditional cultures will seek help from a medical expert first, and in doing so, will signal that they are open to a medical treatment. When we're looking at a normative standard, what we have to also understand is that while the culture sets the normative standard, when it's internalized by a patient, it becomes their sexual script, what they aspire to. The Western sexual script, as uh, Tally also referred to, sex uh, is equated with intercourse. When people talk about having sex, what they usually mean is penile vaginal intercourse. In the West, the prerequisites for intercourse are desire and consent on the part of uh, both parties. Foreplay is to get ready for sex. And then there's the requisite sex or intercourse. There's the requisite male orgasm and ejaculation. And then typically sex is over. Ideally, men feel responsible to give their female partner an orgasm and ideally would like to give her one with his penis. Many men and women still strive to have simultaneous orgasms achieved through intercourse. In this script, ideally men are always ready for sex and they require little if any physical stimulation as long as they are attracted to their partner, which sometimes in the West gets translated to, if my partner is attractive enough. So you'll see lots of women who take responsibility for their partner's sexual dysfunctions. Traditional cultures, which I am defining as those that embrace sexually conservative, often their religious values, and they're ones that restrict access to sex education, emphasize virginity, sex is restricted to marriage, and duty, and, and a duty is valued over individual fulfillment. The traditional sexual script varies a little bit. Sex is still equated to being intercourse. Foreplay is often optional. Sex or intercourse lasts as long or as short as the male partner is able or interested in. There's the requisite male orgasm and ejaculation and then sex is over. What's missing from this traditional script is desire and consent. Now this is not limited to women. Uh, in many cultures in which marriages are arranged, they're arranged by family members. Uh, Neither partner in the marriage may feel attracted or have sexual desire for the other. By consenting to the marriage, they are essentially consenting to sex. And for women, that often means consenting to uh, sex on her husband's demand or interest. And what's also missing is any emphasis on the importance of female sexual pleasure. So what does this mean for us clinically? Consider some of the following vignettes. You have a patient who complains of erectile dysfunction and he makes no progress, uh, reports no progress even with PDE5 inhibitors. Maybe unbeknownst to you, he has a partner who does not want to, who doesn't know how to, who doesn't know that she could stimulate him physically. And even if you ask that question, if he's getting the physical stimulation, he may not want a partner who wants to, knows how to, or does stimulate him physically, because he may be wedded to the, um, the cultural script of a chaste and therefore passive sexual partner. Neither partner may know the importance of sexual attraction to sexual function. Or consider a female patient who complains of, se of uh, pain with sexual intercourse. But again, perhaps unbeknownst to you, her male partner believes that delaying his orgasm for a long time is very healthy for him. This is again back to the idea of conserving semen, that it's pleasurable for him to delay his orgasm or to defer it, and it's the desired behavior on his part. 
this may continue a cycle of painful intercourse, despite the fact that you believe you are successfully treating her pain. Another instance of erectile dysfunction from a patient who subjectively and objectively seems to have adequate erections. Consider the possibility that he has a partner with vaginismus because in traditional cultures that value virginity, men expect sex to be difficult. They expect sex to be painful for their partner. They anticipate that on the wedding night, they may have to break her hymen. Uh, and this expectation that a potent male will be able to do so leads some men to believe that they are impotent if they cannot. Finally, let's consider a clinical presentation of premature ejaculation with a partner who has pain with sex, who doesn't enjoy sex, who has little or no attraction or desire for her partner. Now, this presentation is actually not uncommon, even with patients from Western cultures. But it's important to note that some men from uh, the Middle East, from Sub-Saharan African cultures, or from Southeast Asia, have an aversion to wetness and prefer their partners to have dry vaginas, thus perpetuating pain and lack of arousal for their female partners, and therefore perpetuating her desire and interest in doing things so that he will hurry up. This cultural privileging of pleasure has many pitfalls. First of all, for men, they face tremendous pressure to perform with passive, sometimes reluctant, sometimes even resistant partners. They're expected to take the lead sexually and yet may have little sexual experience or education. Women are expected to be chaste. Sometimes that translates into being passive. They are often required to have little or no sexual knowledge and no sexual experience prior to marriage. They're not supposed to advocate for their own sexual pleasure. So we find ourselves as sexual medicine uh, professionals or sex therapists to improve sexual function where there's little or no desire or attraction. But one thing that's important is that we should not intervene in a couple where there is no consent at, on the part of one party to have a sexual interaction. And this is something you would need to ask. We need to culturally adapt because our ethnic minority patients don't do as well in treatment as our Western patients do. Our practices are based on our understanding of a Western sexual script. And so they may not, in fact, are often not appropriate for those from other cultures. So cultural adaptations would be that which would facilitate a strong alliance between patient and physician, where there would be the possibility of developing a shared understanding of what the problem is and an agreement as to treatment goals. It's important to understand that the expectation of sexual pleasure for women is not universal. You should include the partner in consultation if only really also to see that there is consent for intervention into the sexual relationship. And in those cultures in which female sexual pleasure is not just uh, seen as unnecessary, but it's threatening. Situating a fe female sexual responding in the context of male pleasure may be one pathway to change. So if sex equals intercourse, and intercourse requires an erect penis, as Tally was mentioning, it's also important to educate people that uh, sexual intercourse also requires a welcoming vagina. There's also opportunity for intervention if there's a desire for more pleasure, which would translate into a desire to last longer and therefore treating premature ejaculation or to experience orgasm. And again, situating the fact that uh, healthy female sexual responding can be part of increasing male pleasure, can incorporate female sexual pleasure into the conversation in a culturally acceptable manner. So if we just quickly revisit 
the patient who had erectile dysfunction or thought he had erectile dysfunction, but has a partner with vaginismus. We would describe female sexual responding in culturally acceptable language. In many parts of the world that value virginity, there's an idea that vaginas can be locked. Many women will complain that their vagina is still locked. You can refer or examine the female partner to determine if her vagina is indeed locked using that terminology. You can explain that to unlock a vagina during sexual activity requires patience, care, and sexual stimulation. You can inform patients that to know when a vagina is unlocked, will you can look for lubrication, elasticity, but most importantly, consent or encouragement on the part of your female partner. So these are some of the ideas that are helpful in terms of cultural adaptation. But in many cases, referral to a sex therapist may be required when there's uh, complications or treatment resistance or the problem seems to require the attention of uh, a psychologist or counselor. have an existing network and there is a mental health group right here at SMSNA. So there are ways in which you can definitely make a referral to a sex therapist for someone from a traditional culture more acceptable by knowing that they're part of the medical treatment team. Okay. Most importantly, taking the time to talk, to listen and to really understand what someone is talking about is essential. So I thank you for your time and I will also provide uh, just a few resources that I think might be helpful uh, to you in your practice, culturally adapting your practice to different cultural groups. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, Catherine and, and Tali, we are so lucky that we had uh, you both with us today and uh, I know I have a lot of questions that I would like to start with, but I'm also just very aware that we have a bunch of folks um, on the webinar and want to encourage anyone um, who's with us today to uh, put your questions into either the Q&A box. I think that's right, Danielle. We're not using the chat box. Is that correct? Well, the Q&A box does not seem to be working because I don't see any questions in it and I couldn't enter one in there myself. So I'm encouraging people to put their questions into the chat box. Okay. Okay, um, I can I, I, I I'm going to start the ball rolling if that's okay. Um, you know, thinking about uh, both what Catherine and Tali said in terms of how we um, are often in a position to really both be learning about the um, the very specific uh, cultural expectations or uh, potential uh, restrictions sort of within a cultural framework, and yet at the same time having a, a real understanding that um, a, a couple or an individual may be coming to us because they're distressed in some way, something is not working. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, you know, to start with Tali, if you may give us a, like an example of how you, for example, have worked uh, with clergy um, or with a couple in order to navigate some of the particular types of restrictions. So when you talk about, you know, a uh, sensate focus, something that we're all very familiar with and often use in our practice um, with a couple that has enormous concern about restriction, um, about erection or uh, ejaculation outside of the vagina. Um, just, it would be great if you could give us a little bit of a sense of how you, how you navigate some of that. Sure, so thanks for the question. Um, I think before I directly answer the question, I just wanna say a little bit about consent um, and, to, um, and to make the um, distinction between cognitive consent, you know, the idea of consent and the um, experience, the emotional and physical experience which often tells a different story. So it is important to, um, to, to, when we talk to our patients about consent, and this is why it is so important to involve therapy, many of them will say, at, at least on a cognitive level, this is what I want. In other words, they have um, 
a very strong intellectual and rational part of themselves that would like to do the right thing, that would like to have sex, that would like to please their husbands and be available for them. And they see this kind of disembodied part of them, their vagina, which is this organ that is not cooperating with what they actually want. And what ends up really happening is that when you are able to get into the more emotional and more somatic experience of the patient and also explain to, you know, what happens in the amygdala, in the, in the emotional brain, in their fight or flight center, when they are confronted with uh, the, the penis coming to them and why they go into this anxious reactive state. You know, they want to understand the dissonance between their cognitive part that wants so much to do this act, but that in fact, they are um, experiencing trauma. And the more that they try and have sex, the more they experience trauma. And even if cognitively and even emotionally, they don't necessarily experience their partner um, as coercive or as threatening, their amygdala is experiencing their partner and the idea of penetration as coercive and threatening. And the sad part about this is that the partner himself is in a dilemma because he doesn't want to be a perpetrator. He doesn't want to be in a position to, to force himself into his wife's vagina either. And so having kind of like this global understanding of what they are being expected to do um, in a way that they can actually understand it and bring it to clergy or, you know, because otherwise if they're talking to a rabbi and they're not having an understanding of their own emotional um, you know, they just say, well, we can't get it in. What do we do? And the rabbi says, well, you need to get it in a little bit in order that you don't, you know, break the rule. And the little bit is right at the entry, which many of us know is the painful part when there's uh, a vestibulodynia, it's at the entry. So just kind of getting it at the entry and leaving it there to ejaculate there can be the most difficult thing. Um, and I have had situations where I've really explained this. And for the most part, um, I, I mean, I was listening to Catherine's, you know, and of course it brings up a lot of, a lot of counter-transference types of feelings, difficult feelings, when you're confronted with the fact that there are women and men who don't have agency and don't have autonomy. But the truth is, is that's really not ideally the way Judaism works and the way the rabbis work. It's how the patriarchy works. It's how people use Jewish law and distort it in a way to promote their own power. So um, usually, I would say almost always, there are compassionate um, ways to work around these laws. And because these, because I have spent a lot of time educating rabbis that you can't tell the woman ever that she has to. The minute you say she has to, and she, she needs to know that she never has to in order to be able to heal without having that autonomy over her body, her amygdala is going to continue to fire every time. And I've, I've not really had too many problems. I have done a lot of work in this area. I've written articles geared to rabbis. I have, uh, uh, I have a chapter in a feminist Jewish book. There's a feminist Jewish organization and they have conference every year. And uh, it's called um, uh, I Am His Vessel and the Impact of Ejaculatory Restrictions on Women. And it was a plea to rabbis to please be sensitive and aware how women without autonomy cannot heal, cannot, um, if you don't feel like you're in charge of your body, obviously your vagina is going to lock, you know, your pelvic floor is, is, is protecting you because you don't have you know, the ability to verbally protect yourself. Uh, Sally, sorry, let me uh, just, I mean, as I'm listening to you, I'm really struck by, first of all, you know, you know this community really, really well. Uh, I would just say too, for, for those of those participants who are, who are listening, who, who don't understand, you know, um, Orthodox Judaism or some, uh, some other cultural groups, I would have to say, for, for example, I have found when I've worked with Orthodox couples, because there's a large Orthodox community just about an hour from, from where I practice, is they are actually really welcoming when I ask questions. I ask questions 
and I tell them, I'm sorry, I don't know, I don't understand how this works, what exa you know, what exactly are the requirements and the restrictions? Because also, as you were saying, you know, it's not just knowing about, we can't just turn to books and find out how Orthodox Judaism relates to sexuality. Just the same way we couldn't open a book and say, how do Americans approach sex? Or how do Christians or Muslims approach sex? It's, it's different. So I find that actually talking to patients and saying, I don't understand, I don't know, uh, is helpful. And I've also found rabbis very willing to talk to me um, because it's a community that's very motivated for this couple to succeed, which is, which is wonderful, you know, and, and helpful. In some of the culture couples that I work with, you know, these are people who are really having culture shock. They've, they've gotten, they've been, had an arranged marriage often, you know, it's a man typically who has lived in the U.S. for a while, gone back to India or his country of origin, gets a bride. She's now separated from her family. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite traumatic. And there's quite a culture shock also with different sexual mores that, that, that they're exposed to here. They have now this expectation sex should be pleasurable, but they don't know how that's supposed to work. Um, but I think asking questions and being comfortable being naive is, is one of the main things we can do. I appreciate you saying that, Catherine, because that, that extends to, uh, I think that goes beyond just sexuality, right? In terms of the, the issues around cultural sensitivity when um, this is a time where we are often thinking a lot about that in psychotherapy and recognizing that um, sometimes not being reductionistic and trying to assume, but starting with a, 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 an open sense of inquiry um, from the patient, him or herself, um, is a really important place to start. So thank you for that comment. So there was a question from um, Catherine actually to Tali. Um, can you talk about uh, sexual aversion in this population? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the sexual aversion, uh, and I, I don't think that we know um, what the statistics are, or what the data are in terms of having, but I think just like vaginismus is likely to have a higher prevalence um, in these more faith-based cultures, uh, aversion is likely to as well. Although aversion is very much a function of general anxiety, as well as necessarily a function of hypersensitivity. Um, I've seen aversion in men as well as in women. Um, and some of it is actually, um, can be traced to very, very early exposure to pornography um, and not necessarily from a place of complete under exposure necessarily. Um, I'd be interested actually, Catherine, in how you might put a cultural backdrop to aversion in your um, clinical um, practice and in your experience. Um, so, you know, aversion, which is in, in, in many cases, it's, it's like the negative aspect of desire, right? So instead of I just don't really want to or feel like it, it's like I actively don't want to. Often it's accompanied by a feeling of disgust related to sexual, I mean, and the aversion can be different. It can relate to sexual activity itself. It can relate to one's own feeling of sexual arousal. In some cases, that's tied to experiences with abuse. Um, it can be related to body parts. Um, but I also think that, you know, early intervention is really important because by the time, you know, we see couples, they're often at the end of their rope. Um, and, you know, for a lot of these couples, they've been having sex that is not good, you know, over and over again. So it's not necessarily that it's, you know, painful, but it's, but sometimes there's pain and then just sometimes there's, I don't like this, I'm not aroused, I'm not interested. And over and over again, having sex that you are consenting to but don't enjoy or want, over time I see that developing into uh, an aversion to sex in general. 
we've had a couple of questions around homosexuality. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there because, and I know that this is uh, just the beginning of a conversation. We couldn't possibly cover it now, but um, I, I am curious if either of you wants to, to speak a little bit to this question of what happens when um, there's some kind of disclosure around uh, homosexuality in a traditional context where that is taboo. Um, how, what, are, what might be some uh, strategies for how one starts to either offer resources to patients or uh, begins to sort of think about, you know, where one might go to sort of help somebody who's struggling in this way? Yeah, what a what a loaded question, right? Sorry, because it, right? No, but it, right? I mean, it's it, it's important, and I have worked with you know couples in traditional relationships who say this is you know uh, who first of all say I am attracted to the same sex, but I cannot and will not act on that because what's important to me is to keep my community, to keep with my faith, to keep with my traditions but I am, you know, I'm gay and, or bisexual, which is another, uh, you know, which I do believe there are people who are bisexual as well. And it's loaded because certainly if you're an advocate for uh, LGBTQ rights, you would want someone to sort of be true to their sexual identity. However, as therapists, we really are, you know, apart from what we might be advocating as sexual health professionals, we're there to sort of help a person find their own path that's, that's helpful for them. But then there's the tricky question of, you know, do you disclose this to a partner, for example? Um, so I have worked with some people, and I did have one man who did disclose to his, well, I've had two, one disclosed to his partner, and it was just terribly, uh, it was terrible. I mean, I think they did end up actually getting a divorce, which was catastrophic in terms of their families. And another whose partner accepted the fact that he was gay and that they would have to try to find ways to manage their sexual interactions. Um, but I've had others who say, I will never tell anybody. You know, our job as therapists is to help people navigate these really difficult situations. Tali, have you had this experience? Yeah, so uh, it's very interesting because with the very um, uh, ultra-Orthodox or Hasidic societies, it's really not unusual as part of the developmental process to engage in activities with the same sex. Um, and that partially has to do with the fact that you only have access to the same sex. But this becomes part of their wiring, and it's important to nuance that vis-a-vis -vis overall sexual orientation. It's really not binary, it's really not black and white. It's like if somebody comes to me and says, I think I'm asexual, um, if they don't have any sense of themselves, if they don't have a sense of self, not to mention a sense of a sexual self, it's difficult to make that determination of asexuality because you know, you haven't developed. And I think that this is true in terms of orientation as well. Um, and again, as practitioners, obviously we have no agenda and we are just trying to help the patient understand himself and his own sexuality. Obviously, when there is a pretty absolute, you know, gay situation, I am gay, and there's a desire to pray away the gay, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be professionals and we're going to help them to kind of look at that conflict as something that they may or may not be able to integrate and, you know, may have to accept. Um, there, fortunately, there's, there, there's more acceptance for um, gay couples, at least in the more liberal and modern um, sectors of Orthodox society. It is not there yet in the society that I was talking about in today's talk. Um, but again, uh, it's really hard to know. Uh, I think that these young men or young women don't even know themselves to say that they're necessarily homosexual if just because they've had homosexual experiences. There's Thank a question you. here about, um, do you have any suggestion about the difficulty of men with penile cancer? I'm doing an academic research 
uh, about the men and their sexuality. Do you have anything to add? Thank you. So and Yella, I, you might take that yeah, one. I have a little experience with that. I work in the space of uh, men and uh, cancer, primarily prostate and bladder cancer, but I have had a few patients with penile cancer and the, the challenge there is that these uh, men reserve their sexual desire while um, a smaller or larger portion of their penis is removed and so they cannot have sexual intercourse and uh, may not even respond well to just manual stimulation. So one of the things that I've discussed with the surgeons that I've worked um, is one of them told me that he used to work in the uh, with, with people who got injured in the mines in West Virginia and the surgeons would try to preserve the pudendal nerve and put it somewhere under the skin so that the men could continue to stimulate for pleasure even though they lost their functioning penis. And um, I have clinical experience with a man who had a much foreshortened penis and was really uh, very interested in sex. And he could only have uh, sexual pleasure by rubbing very hard against his wife who had arthritis, it was really quite difficult. And he would sometimes put objects into the, his remaining urethra to stimulate himself. And then the objects would end up in his bladder. He had to go to the emergency room. So one of the things that we talked about was finding alternative places for sexual stimulation. Sometimes nipples can be sexually stimulated and trained to, for a person to reach orgasm. And of course, men have the ability to stimulate the prostate, which for heterosexual men might feel frightening, kind of as a homosexual, as a gay act, but it certainly is stimulate a ball um, area. So, you know, trying to discuss with that person, recognizing that they remain a sexual being, even after having had a portion of their penis removed uh, is important. And then looking for strategies to uh, access sexual pleasure with them and, and with their partner would be the methodology that I've pursued. Sharon, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, I do. And I, I, I guess I would, I just want to ask, I realize we only have a couple of minutes left, but I feel like that's an interesting question. Um, sort of to end with, because there's also such a loaded cultural piece around that as well, right? With, with uh, the notion of, you know, how, and I think both Tali and Catherine got at this, you know, that, um, you know, how does one see oneself as a lover, as a sexual person? Um, it's not only about physical pleasure, but it's a, the idea that, you know, without my penis being the way that it was, I'm no longer a man. Um, and so, you know, partly what you're saying, Daniela, is that, you know, when we're helping people um, in a uh, both strategic and creative way, think about other ways to uh, give and receive pleasure. It also is speaking to the very basic kind of cultural expectations uh, or normative ideas around um, how, in this case, uh, one can be a man um, if, if one's penis is not the way that it used to be. So, um, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, in terms of uh, sort of my thoughts today that, you know, both of these talks give so much food for thought. I'm so grateful to have been here with both of you today um, and, and to recognize that, um, you know, this is something, this lens around sort of cultural curiosity and awareness is something um, really incumbent on all of us to bring to the work every day. Um, and that sometimes the examples um, may seem more extreme, um, you know, in, in terms of a culture or social experience, which is very different than our own. And sometimes it may be more subtle. Um, but I think raising our, you know, each of us sort of raising our awareness around uh, sort of the notion of, you know, where the partner is coming from or where the sort of social, cult social culture norms one may be coming from, whether it's religion or whether it's a particular country or culture, is just so helpful um, to, for us all to remember that it's not just about the mechanics of sex, you know, it's not all just about uh, uh, the biology, you know, and that, you know, really taking that biopsychosocial model seriously, um, it expands the lens. So uh, last thoughts for me. And Daniela, how about you? Yeah, I just want to say that um, I really appreciate the presentations of the speakers. I think that you really are expanding our consciousness. I think this is a really good topic for the Sexual Medicine Society. And I hope this is really just the first one of many that we have on this topic. We do, after all, have 
um, a connection with the International Society of Sexual Medicine, and we have many members who are members of both societies. And this is a topic that I think is very, very suitable for ongoing um, discussion and education for all of us. So thank you speakers and thank you attendees. So happy that you were able to, to come and participate today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.